list, and I promised that I would take as many as I possibly could. So if we could, by a show of hands, oh, any, any person, someone coming behind you. Just go boop, boop. Hi, I'm Amory. We got to meet a couple times, we which did. was awesome. Thank you. Um, I actually like kind of already knew your story. Um, I saw like an interview where you like talked about it. Um, and so I guess my question is a lot of people who like don't know your story, you know, they can perceive what you say or like how um, you present yourself in like certain like debates or arguments to be like really like overly aggressive or like they immediately like will take something you say and like just um, twist it immediately. Um, do you, like, how do you, how do you kind of combat that? Because I know when I, like, know things and I'm, like, you know, debating somewhere, or, no, not even debating, well, just discussing, um, you know, it can be perceived, like, oh, that's, like, so aggressive, like, why are you being, like, so aggressive? It's like, no, I just know what I'm talking about, and I'm just <laughs> telling you factually. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, so how do you kind of, like, deal with that? Does that, like, kind of perception, like, bother you at all, or, like? No, it doesn't. I, I hear this all the time. We have to understand, we live in a generation where facts are now considered aggressive. I mean, that's just the truth. If you introduce a fact, people will immediately say that they're, it's aggressive and suddenly they're on the defense because it's like, as I said, it's very easy to, to resort to being a victim. Um, so I just say champion it, you know, and, and ask the question, what about what I just said was aggressive? Which piece of what I just said was aggressive? You know, if, if me spitting a fact to you is aggressive and there's no point in us having a conversation, having a dialogue. And by the way, when you see Charlie and I on these campuses, these clips where we're like getting up and all fired up, you have no idea what is going on around us. Can I just tell you, these people are playing, you've got Black Lives Matter that's playing Beyonce music next to us, which is like a most absurd thing, just that we can't hear ourselves think. think. We have people that are standing up screaming like, F the police. Meanwhile, the whole room is lined with amazing police officers protecting these awful individuals, right? <laughs> so you'd be shocked. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm very proud of myself for having managed to keep my cool this long, because sometimes I'm like, turn off the Beyonce music. But I, I keep it together. <laughs> Thank you for your question. One over here on your right. Hello, um, my name is Jess, and I want to know your opinion on how the free market will better, if you believe that the free market will better assist those at or below the poverty line compared to governmental assistance programs or welfare. Oh, of course, absolutely. So I, I live this really in my life. I have family that's on welfare, a governmental program currently, and I have family that has never taken welfare. So I get to actually see the differences. So the biggest thing about the welfare system is that it discourages people. Why would you go out um, and try to do better in your life, the government is giving you a certain amount of money. And they say, but if you make a little bit above this certain amount of money, we're gonna take away what we're giving you. So then you're, you're back down. So it literally, people are trying, it incentivizes people to try to work around the system and to never do better than a certain threshold. Okay, so that's the number one thing. And then we can also talk about how the welfare system incentivizes people not to marry you know, the father of their children. I, I mean, I have a lot of, I have nothing good to say about welfare programs. I think if you want to turn people into victors and into fighters, you have to put their backs against the wall. And there's no better example of this. You guys may have seen my PragerU video. I love PragerU. Um, <laughs> that my grandfather, I was fortunate to have been raised in my grandfather's home um, during my formative years. And my grandfather grew up on a sharecropping farm. He picked cotton. Um, and he ended his life on that same sharecropping farm, retired, and he owns the sharecropping farm. Okay, uh, that's, that's the American dream, right? Um, so that is thanks to free markets and capitalism, and this is why it's so important that Donald Trump is in office slashing regulations. Is what, like, what makes people go against entrepreneurship is when they can't even have an idea before they owe the government thousands and thousands of dollars for even trying to attempt their idea. I know so many people that have had ideas that are discouraged by our government system. And the only way to solve poverty is through entrepreneurship. My grandfather started a dry cleaning business, and that's how he made his money, and he was allowed to do that. So I am pro-free markets, and I, I will always shout and say that that is the only system that helps defeat poverty. Hi, Candace. Hi. My name is Jessica. Um, I just want to give you maybe 30 seconds background to the question. Sure. Then I want to ask you generally um, what you think the solution is, and then specifically for me, if you have any advice. So feels like a test. Yeah, just to lay it out, just <laughs> so you know remember, I'm not rambling. Answer, okay. Um, so I just actually came back from overseas. I was with um, Peace Corps, as I have an education background, um, and I'm trying to support myself through. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> That's 
<laughs> not the reason. Oh, anyways, um, so I'm trying to support myself with grad school in DC. Um, and so naturally, I'm a substitute teacher in inner city DC. I just started in January or February. Um, and I'm usually one of the only, um, I'm the minority in the building. Um, they usually send the security guard with me, usually the first couple times, <laughs> just a little worried about me. Um, and it's been a really eye-opening experience. Um, the first day that I was there, um, I was with middle school students and I, they walked in and they, everyone's just so angry. That, and I didn't know why everyone was so angry. And um, they ended up getting this all out fight and it was just like a really rough situation. And um, afterwards, there's three ladies who follow these kids around all day. And um, they came up to me and I'll never forget their expression. And they were just like, this is what we do all day, every day. And it, to me, it was like, oh my gosh, like, I am so sorry. And this is actually, this is before I knew who you were, this is before I know anything about you. Um, and so I went back and I just like, um, called my mom and I was just like, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm in this inner city. I don't understand the culture. I don't understand the black community and the African American community. Um, and literally the next day is when you drop that, you know, um, that amazing, uh, I think it was at Berkeley, where you were UCLA. Saying, at UCLA. Yeah. Um, and that was just like, yes, answer to prayer. <laughs> so that was awesome to see. Um, so that's kind of the context. Um, my question is, I don't know what the answer is, and I understand that they need to get off of welfare. I understand that there needs to be an awakening of the mind, but when I'm in there and I'm living in that culture, I mean, that's what I do, you know, Monday through Fridays now. Um, well, except it's summer break now, but um, <laughs> that's what I do, and it's terrifying to tell them, for instance, I'm somebody who's pro-life. There are so many girls that get abortions in the school, you know, right. 15, 16 year old girls. And so I'm thinking, am I just saying like by my vote that I'm condemning them to a life of, you know, single motherhood and right. poverty. Right. Um, I don't believe in domestic violence and I go after, you know, boys who will just smack girls in front of me and say like, you shouldn't treat them that way. But the girls like that attention because they think that's love, you know? So it's just, right. I'm confused on how to solve that. Um, as somebody who's not part of the culture, right. and then just generally where you see the U.S. going, if we're going to get them off of welfare, if we're going to be pro-life, how are we going to f help them and not just, you know, how right. are we going to help them basically? So what I would say off the bat is that the number one thing that has been going wrong is that the black community keeps looking on the outside for other people to fix the black community, okay? The black community has to fix itself. And... <laughs> That's partially because, and I will say this, we have been told lies. It is systematic. If you are working inside of a, a school, then you understand how the textbooks gear everything to make it seem that Republicans and conservatives are racist and Democrats and liberals are heroes. Meanwhile, the Democrats have actually created the very system that has defeated the black community entirely. They've created the system that allows the single motherhood rate to jump 74% since the 1960s. They've created the system that makes it so that black men end up in prison, right? If you remove the father from the home, you're 20 times more likely um, to end up behind bars. Uh, so the issue is I always try to say that we've been bickering in the black community. Black people don't like to talk about black issues. They want to blame it on somebody else because that feels better in general. If we could all just stick our issues onto somebody else, it would be a lot easier. Um, it's time for new leaders. It's why I'm so disruptive. It's why they hate me so much. Um, and I think in the past, and by the way, I'm not the first person. There were many trailblazers that came before me. Uh, if you would like to show your kids videos of Dr. Thomas Sowell, Dr. Ben Carson, Condoleezza Rice. Okay? These are my idols. I, I love these people, but the truth is, is those kids aren't reading those books. So what are they paying attention to? Social media, YouTube. That's why I started on YouTube. That's why I use humor. That's why I make the videos really short, because I understand the attention span of um, the, just the generation that we're in. So it's about disrupting what the left has had a stranglehold on, and as you mentioned before, that's culture. Right? That's why the Kanye tweet was so significant, because it opened up the conversation in a way that had never been opened up before in black America. So um, I appreciate all the work that you're doing, uh, but I want to let you know that the burden is not yours, it's ours. Hi. Hi, Candace. My name is Loren. I am a big fan. I just want to say, first of all, you're the embodiment of what it means to be a strong woman. And I, am, I have two little sisters, and I am so proud that they are, you are someone that they can look up to. 
And my question is, I also used to be horrifically bullied in high school. I got death threats all the time. Someone actually put a status on Facebook saying like the status if you want her to commit suicide. Over 300 people liked it. And you know, as someone who is so politically active, like what is your advice to, like, to keep your mental health in check when you have so much, so much hate? And one more thing, I love the way Candace Owens thinks. <laughs> Uh, social media, and first off, that is horrendous, and I'm really sorry to hear that happen to you. I've heard stories like that, and it always devastates me, because I, I don't think parents understand how mean the internet can be, and, and it's not even the fault of the children. It's just, it's really hard to be mean face-to-face. -face. It's really easy to be mean on the internet, but I think that that's sort of the dialogue that parents and, and their children need to be having about social media, that they're, they're, they need to understand what that is the pathway to. And look, you made it, obviously. It's about teaching your children uh, self-confidence. And I'm, I really think that in the school system, we see a breakdown of self-confidence over time. And it's because children are constantly being told what they're not good at in school, right? You're not that good at math. You are maybe good at science. And it's, there's not enough to build up children in general. And it, it, it starts within the home, it really does. But there's, there also has to be more done in school to let students feel that they are doing something good. There's not enough positive reinforcement. Um, but I have tried so many times to open the conversation on social media and the way that it affects the youth particularly. I think when, you're, when you get to a certain age, it's like, all right, be on the internet or not. Um, but it's really hard for children to stay off the internet without losing all of their friends when they're younger. Um, but yeah, I think it, it really starts with more conversations and a better build up on home and a structure because we are in a totally different generation and it is eating away at children's confidence. I'm really sorry you went through that. This will be the last question. Oh. Hi, I'm Paige. I'm 11. I'm from Frisco. My question is, who... 11 year olds here. Can we just give her... <laughs> Who and or what motivated you to get into politics? And when did you know you wanted to make it your career? Wow, that's a really good question. So um, I think the person that motivated me was Donald Trump. I think that is... While I was sick in bed, getting better, um, you know, I was watching him, I was watching the political season, and I grew up listening to hip-hop my whole life, and they love Donald Trump. Rappers love Donald Trump. It's all about Mar-a-Lago, I'm doing this like Trump, 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 he was the man. Then he announces that he's running for the White House, and they were like, nope, he's a racist, just kidding. And I said, all right, now let's, let's be clear here. I'm not going to believe that this man became a racist overnight, right? So it just started to make me question all of my beliefs, and... I came up with understanding that racism was being used as a theme to turn black people into single issue voters, uh, you know, to make sure that we were constantly in a state of fear, that we were so fearful that we had to vote one way because the other way was going to send us, send us back to Africa on, you know, on slave ships. And I thought it was ridiculous and I was, you know, upset to see that culture in Hollywood was pretending that that was real. Uh, all of these actors and actresses doing what they do best, acting as if Donald Trump was going to be a monster. And I decided, let's, you know, let's beat them at their own game. Conservatives can be funny. Conservatives are considered so serious. And I said, if I can make a YouTube channel and I can be funny and I can do voices because I love humor and make fun of people, um, then let's level the playing field a little bit. And so I decided in... July to quit my job. I was working in finance and I called someone and I said, I think I'm going to quit my job and start making YouTube videos. And at first they were like, what? And then they were super supportive. I was like, I don't know. I just feel that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and it's time to wake up the world. Look, I don't recommend it. I don't think everybody should go home and quit their jobs. <laughs> that would be a headline at New York Times. Candace Owens encourages a bunch of young women to go quit their jobs. But I think when you have a calling and that sometimes, you know, God puts something in your heart and you know it's real, then go for it. <laughs> Is that it? I think that's it. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'll be outside to take pictures.